today, I thought I'd talk a bit about the the fetters that fall away when um, one realizes stream entry. Those first three of the ten that um, that are released and it gives us some indication about how to shape our practice if we haven't gotten to that point yet. So, and also it's, I'm gonna tie in the request that Val had uh, last time for thinking about this year and how it's changed us. So we'll see if I can weave that together. And I see that she's not here, but we're recording this so I can send her a, a link to it later. The three uh, fetters that fall away, as you may well know, I don't know, but one is um, Sakaya Ditti, which is the view that uh, particularly the body, but any of the khandas are self, that, that that's who we are and what we are and that the the realization of stream entry which in the suttas is often characterized as realizing that everything that arises ceases everything that comes into being again falls apart falls away and this this is a profound realization because it really is the opening to the chain of dependent origination where you recognize that everything in our experience is based on other conditions and that those conditions are constantly changing and when they change to the point where whatever it is we're attached to or dependent upon uh, can no longer stand then we suffer and we suffer while they stand because they we know that they will not eventually so we fall in love there's always a fear that it's not going to work out or at some point that person that we care about is going to disappear from our life and of course that happens one way or another every relationship ends now we could go into a much more um, metaphysical place here because in a sense, I, I feel like it doesn't end with death, but it certainly is a huge change that we often do not want. And so it is with everything else that we cherish, that line in the chanting, all that is mine, beloved, and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separated from me. And of course, the maybe the thing we hold most tightly to is this concept, this perception of self, which we've been talking about a fair bit lately. It's so fundamental to our understanding of the Dhamma, to our awakening to the Dhamma. So this, this um, view that I am, this body and mind, that fetter, that barrier falls away with stream entry, with Sotapanna. That's in Pali called Sakaya Ditti. The, um, one of the other three usually listed third, I'm gonna do the second one last here because it's the one I wanna put the attention on. But the third one is wichikicha, which is doubt. And I love the word wichikicha. It just kind of tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> um, doubting, um, the, the doubt is primarily the doubt in the Buddha Dhamma and enlightened Sangha. And, when the when stream entry occurs, when that opening happens, and we see for ourselves directly experience um, sort of this this glimpse of nibbana, 
our faith in the Buddha is solidified and our faith in the Dhamma is unshakable and our faith in the enlightened Sangha is is clarified it's it's completely secure now what's important about understanding these things knowing this is that it's a guide for our practice so when teachers that I've known especially in Thailand have the sense that people are sincere and serious on the path and maybe you know certainly heading in the direction of stream entry then they might give them a practice of chanting the qualities of the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha which we do um, almost daily in the monastery and it's it's the way of taking it in intellectually first and then really investigating those qualities and looking at you know what about this do i do i know is true i know in my heart is true not based on some kind of blind faith but based on our experience so like the qualities of the dhamma um, the the truth of the Dhamma, this is something we can observe ourselves, right? We see when we think about, you know, how has this year changed me or how have I changed? How have I developed what has happened that's changed since I took up understanding, studying and practicing meditation or practicing Dhamma? You know, if we look at that, we can see how the Dhamma actually works. Um, we can verify uh, examples of it in our own life. And one really um, good example of that that I really enjoyed, because I really enjoy watching this <laughs> as people change. Um, there was a man who came to our center years ago who was in a lot of stress. And he was really searching. He found us on the internet and he came. And one of the things that happened, um, he started attending every week our sutta study. But one of the things that happened early on was that Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi came to visit us. And this man and his wife uh, asked if they could offer the meal. So they came and had time with uh, with us and with with Bhikkhu Bodhi, kind of without anybody else around. And the first thing that Bhikkhu Bodhi did was to uh, give them the precepts. And uh, they are they are Indian. They were Indian Buddhists. And um, his wife, the wife, was really practicing, but the the husband was you know so focused on making it in the world, which is kind of understandable, right? But when he took the pre the five precepts, he really took it seriously, and it really changed his life over over a matter of weeks and months. You know, it's just it was a huge had a huge impact. And so, just you know, any example like this that we see in the growth and development of others, or that we see in our own life, this is a help helps us verif verify the the efficacy of the Dhamma the truth of the Dhamma. And of course, there are many um, aspects of Dhamma that are much more subtle and we become better and better at, at observing them and, and taking having our direct experience of those things. So this faith, this is, this is one of the, the, the doubt in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the enlightened Sangha falls away. But the third one, as I said, usually mentioned in, in the middle, is one that I had, I've never seen get very much attention really. And I know for myself, I haven't paid as much attention to this one. It's um, Sila Bhatta Paramasa. It's often translated as the observance of rites and rituals or the attachment to rites and rituals. And sometimes it feels like, yeah, that was 
applicable in ancient India, but I'm not so sure it's such a big deal now. How attached are we to rites and rituals after all? You know, it's something you kind of place in the context of having strong beliefs in a spiritual tradition or philosophy or practice and you're practicing things that, you know, you can't really see any particular relationship to your life um, perhaps but you do it because you're supposed to or you do it because you believe that it's it's going to somehow save you from suffering but you can't really see the cause and effect perhaps you know so this idea that you just blindly follow some you know prescribed activity uh, is going to kind of, I mean, I sort of felt that way. My mother used to say this about our church, you know, people, you have to go to church, she said, that's, that's what they believe. And then that, that's all you have to do. You don't have to like clean up your act when you're in business or uh, behave better in your family. You have to just, just go to church. That's it. That's enough. But of course, she was ridiculing that because she didn't buy into it. And it, and if one and many people, of course, going to church meant a lot more than that. They really did live the, the beliefs and the teachings. But if it's a perfunctory, superficial action, you know, we know that it's not really going to have a lot of power and good results. And of course, people do this with Buddhism too. You know, it's, it's interesting traveling in Sri Lanka or Thailand or other um, countries where Buddhism is the main religion. We have the same thing that we see here with, with the religions that are, that are based here. People grow up with those philosophies. They might go through the motions. You might go to church on, you know, I have friends who, you know, they go to church at Christmas and Easter, but that's about it, you know, and, and uh, there are Vesak Buddhists. They just, you know, like check in on, on the holy days, but the rest of the time, it doesn't have much of a place in their life. And, and, and I've, I saw one um, Sri Lankan man come to the Vihara when I was just starting out as an Anagarika. And he, he was so, on fire with the Dhamma. And he said it came because there was a meditation kind of seminar in his company. And he, he finally got that there's a point to the practice. He's like, grew up as a Buddhist all his life, but not, it never touched his heart until here he's in America and he has, he, in the corporate setting, he gets a meditation class and suddenly he's like, wow, <laughs> this is really something. <laughs> and suddenly he's, He's finding the Dhamma. So, you know, to, to really recognize, you know, it's really about the effort we put in, right? But there's a deeper perspective, I think, on this idea of uh, sila bhata paramata. And one hint was I was listening to a talk by Ajahn Sumedho, and he called it, social and cultural conditioning. So that's that's a, a different sort of depth where we see that we have these um, patterns, these habits, this, this whole many layers of actions, behaviors that we kind of adopt and go along with. Um, and and we're, we do it without being aware of the real point or the purpose, perhaps. It's, it really comes down to how present and aware are we? How, how self-reflective are we? Are we observing our habits and patterns, you know, from a place of investigation and awareness? Or are we just going along with what everybody around us is doing? Are we just picking up beliefs and following protocols and, you know, doing what our parents did? I was kind of amazed when I was raising my kids 
that I thought I was pretty conscious and really looking at how to be a good mom and, you know, what to do to support them. But at one point, I looked at the the decisions that I made, and I saw that they were in line with what my parents had done. It maybe wasn't so, you know, um, conscious and um, kind of self-aware as I thought. And it even, you know, like the the reactions that you have when you're too tired or when you're pushed to the edge, your back is against the wall, those reactions oftentimes don't have a lot of, um, you know, conscious awareness around them. They tend to be the ones that we picked up through osmosis, watching others or listening to others. And what it takes, I think, is to actually give ourselves time to reflect on particularly what we have done in order to investigate, not from a place of like beating ourselves up or because we have that tendency. I I hear that all the time. Um, You know, even the idea of really examining what we've done can be so punitive, but to try, and that too is another habit or, you know, um, kind of practice that we just learn absorb and maybe don't reflect on the consequences too much but to actually you know in a kind way look at how did that work how did that way of handling the situation turn out is this something I want to change is this something that I want to really understand better maybe find alternatives to so these you know this way of um investigating our own patterns, habits, behaviors, actions can can lead us to living in a much more intentional way. And I'm sure really that a lot of you are doing this already, this kind of thing. I'm sure that there are a whole bunch of things about this that Aya Chitananda, did you have some stuff that you wanted to add to this? You see anything there? Expectations of society. Yeah. So much of the time we are um, really perhaps doing what we do because it's what everybody around us is doing. You know, I mentioned it, but look at our situation today in society with extremes of beliefs and approaches and how much of it on an individual basis is because these are the people we hang out with. These are the ideas that we are um, hearing all the time. Particularly, it's interesting when we have so much of our input coming from social media or the internet in general that you know the the um, the efforts that are made to kind of characterize us and what we care about and then feed us that information has caused this as you know this situation where we live in different realities So um, I know someone whose mother has been kind of using one of her email accounts for like there's this junk mail account that this person uses and her mother was using it too. And suddenly she's getting all this kind of Trump supporting stuff in this email box and things that, you know, it's like you get a view into a different reality if you... Um, click on different things and maybe um, like parents having um, kind of watching out what their kids are looking at online or something you get like you can there's a whole different different slices of of um, views and opinions attitudes values that we might pick up without 
being so self-reflective or conscious or really looking at how it relates to Dhamma or what the consequences are. This is one of the things that's hard sometimes to imagine. What are the karmic results of this choice I'm making? How would I, how would I ever discover that? Maybe it takes some imagination or some practice with looking at how things tend to go according to Dhamma. And as I said, I kind of want to weave this in with this idea of looking at the pandemic. Boy, that really has changed our patterns, our habits, our, you know, it's, it's really changed the way that we've interacted with each other. And it's interesting to consider, you know, how attached we are to doing things in a certain way. How easy is it for us to let go of those attachments? This is where this practice of being able to really observe with awareness what it is that we do, what the conditions are we find ourselves in, and accepting those. First and foremost, turn towards the way it actually is. This is how it is. This is how it is right now. This is how I feel. This is what's happening. These are the conditions I find myself in. And then look at how do I, um, what, can, what choices can I make that bring me closer in line with the Dhamma? that bring um, the best possible karmic results. Well, even as I say that, it sounds so perfectionistic. Maybe leave the word best out of it. Wholesome, wholesome karmic results. You know, it's like, there's a, this, all along the way, we have this opportunity to look at, you know, like even those word choices, even those thoughts that we keep coming back to. How does that have, um, you know, an impact on the future? And and then, you know, if we look at like where, how far we've come in our own practice, you know, looking back, what was it like a year ago? What was it like ten years ago? What what was what was I doing? What rites and rituals? What behaviors and characteristics? Um, did I have what things were I thought where what kinds of voices were I was I listening to you know and what were I, what was I following then and now how is it now it's really good to look at the progress it's it's encouraging and um when we when we recognize again back to Ajahn Sumedho that we can trust in awareness of what's happening in the present moment that that this is this is key to our happiness to our ability to not get caught up and drawn in and drawn down by what happens around us what even is arising in our own mind that it's that it's possible to make choices about how we relate to everything in our experience I think that's really what I had to say. Aya Chitananda is um, recalling something she and I talked about before around COVID making us more aware. So that's another another side to it you know like because of this big change in our life we are more likely to stop and think you know like it's it's in some ways so helpful i mean that's not at all to overlook the incredible suffering that's come from it for so many people but even then whatever's happening in our life and I'm thinking about someone I know, her husband has lost five people to COVID in his family. And now her parents both have it. 
and it's 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 been one thing after another for her and her family and it's like you know any of us who are not experiencing that are so fortunate and yet we still have this opportunity to really approach our experience with much deeper awareness because of this because of this shared experience we're having in the world 